discussion, and discovery about the arts in St. George and Southern Utah. And now your hosts for On the Arts, Michael and Christina Harding. Good afternoon, St. George. This is Michael Harding. Unfortunately, my beautiful wife and co-host will not be joining us today. She's unable to be here in the studio. So you are stuck with me and a wonderful guest that we have here. Now, to get things going, I just want to remind everybody that On the Arts is a show that's dedicated to blowing the lid off of all of those little artistic secrets that we have here in Southern Utah. We don't want them to be secrets anymore. One of the things we don't want to hear is when people come to a show or they come to an art exhibit or they come to a store storytelling opportunity, and they just say, boy, this is one of the best kept secrets of Southern Utah. No, we don't want that. We want people to know about what's going on so they can get out and experience these events so they can get out and participate should they need to or want to. Now, we do have some information of something that's coming up very soon, and that's the Art Around the Corner event. Now, I had the pleasure yesterday of sitting down with Susan Jarvis, who is the executive director of Art Around the Corner, and we were able to actually record an interview that we're going to be playing portions of on Thursday's episode of On the Arts. So I invite you to listen in to hear a little bit more about what's going on with that. Just some general information, though. Around or Art Around the Corner is in charge of and responsible for all of those wonderful sculptures that you see around downtown St. George. And actually, the area is expanding that you're going to see these. Now, a perfect example of these sculptures these sculptures, is something that I have brought up many times before on this show. And even when we had Mayor Pike as a guest on here, I brought it up, and that is the large arachnid that is downtown right in the middle of St. George. Now, if you have a phobia of spiders, I might suggest you prepare yourself when you go downtown, but it is a beautiful sculpture of a very much larger-than-life spider down there. And uh, it's a beautiful piece, but I will say I was a little shocked when I first saw it. But Art Around the Corner is the organization that's in charge of choosing the artwork that you're going to see around town. Now, there is going to be an event on Friday evening, and this is a gala event. This is an opportunity for you to meet the 33 artists that are going to be represented in uh, the next year-long presentation of these pieces. Now, this is going to take place at the Hilton downtown, and we want you to know that you are able to actually attend. This isn't just a hoity-toity group, which I actually spoke to Susan Jarvis about. We talked about the misconception of a lot of these events. A lot of people think, oh, this is out of my elite range, if you will. No, this art is for everyone. And we hope you'll take the opportunity to come meet these artists. You can visit AAC St. George at gmail.com to give them your information. Again, that's AAC S T G E O R G E at gmail.com. You can email your information with any questions you have about this event, and they will gladly get back to you and give you more information and specifics so that you can actually attend. A lot of the art pieces that are going to be displayed are for sale. A lot of people think, oh, I don't have those thousands of dollars sitting around to buy these pieces. Now, yes, we do have some pieces that are going to be expensive, but we also have pieces for all price ranges. And these artists love to share their work. They love to get to know the people that they are creating ultimately for here in Southern Utah. So please do take an opportunity to find out more about that. Now, I mentioned that we have a wonderful guest in the studio. And one of the wonderful things about this show is that I get to meet people whose names I have heard for quite a while through various channels. But I actually get to know the people, and that's what this show is about. We get to know the artists behind the art that you actually see. Now, to segue in sloppily to our guest, who is looking at me, I'm not quite sure uh, how to read the look. Uh, But if you do want to check out that look, by the way, check us out on Facebook at Radio St. George. That's Radio Space ST Space George. And you can see a live broadcast of this show. We'll also be archived on that page. You can also check us out at On The Arts on Facebook. And we are streaming live on YouTube, and that will be archived as well. So just type in On The Arts with Michael and Christina Harding, and you'll see a wide variety of interviews with musicians and artists and writers and all sorts of folks on the show. 
Now, that takes me to my sloppy segue. And uh, bear with me on this. My wife often makes fun of me because of my rambling nature in this monologue. But I promise you, it takes me where we need to go. And rambling is actually quite an appropriate word for some of the things we're going to be talking about today. Anyhow, I had the pleasure of working in Las Vegas on a show called Tournament of Kings at the Excalibur Casino. And I'll tell you, it was a great learning experience for me on many, many levels. First of all, it's what I call fast food theater. Now, it's a delightful show. It's something you can take your family to. But the reason I call it that is that there is no official stage manager. There was no sign-in form, and I wasn't used to that, having been a professional actor. I was used to showing up, signing in. The stage manager knew I was there, and then I would deal with the makeup artist who would come and help me. The costume folks would be there to help me, and everything would be very organized. Well, in this particular show, with this particular group, you just showed up, you put on your costume, you put on your makeup, you put on your microphone, and you walked out when it was time to start, and you hoped that the lighting spot operator was there to pick you up. You hoped that the sound man was there on the board ready to pick you up. And I have to say, sometimes they were not. So I learned to improvise. I learned to be out there and perform and entertain in front of a, a, a group of a thousand people and just tell a story and to entertain. And that was one of the greatest learning experiences as an artist I've ever had, being able to listen to an audience and without a script necessarily, just get out and talk to and listen to. Well, there were a lot of dancers in this show, it being the Tournament of Kings, being the King Arthur story, if you will. And we had a lot of young ladies who would dance around. And I made the mistake during one of the shows of saying, is it fun to be a showgirl? And the reaction I got was pretty severe, and I didn't understand it at the time, but they were clear about the fact that they were not showgirls, they were dancers. And they were very, very adamant about that, and started to tell me the difference between a showgirl and a dancer. And that got me thinking about how titles are extremely important, how we as artists define ourselves. For example... I mentioned before that I used to play the violin. My father came to a concert that I was performing in, and he came up to me and my teacher, and he said to my teacher, thank you for helping him play the fiddle so well. And I will never forget the look on my teacher's face, Mr. Faulkner, when it just fell, and he said to my father, well, I don't teach fiddle playing. I teach violin playing and a very specific type of classical playing. And my father said, oh, I'm very sorry. Well, things like that have always fascinated me. And as I look at people's biographies, I've started to become very sensitive to the fact that they don't necessarily just call themselves writers. They are authors of a specific genre. Uh, a lot of times you don't have just a singer. They are singers of a specific genre. And our guest in the studio today has an absolutely fascinating resume and a fascinating history that I can't wait to talk about. But one of the titles that our guest has is Folklorist, and I'm fascinated to find out a little bit more about this. Our guest in the studio today is Mr. Hal Cannon. Thank you for joining here. Great to be here. That's it. Now, Mr. Cannon, I, I mentioned that, may I call you Mr. Cannon or Hal? Or Hal. Hal, fantastic. Uh, I've mentioned that you are a folklorist amongst other titles of songwriter, musician, and radio producer. What is a folklorist? Well, first of all, First and foremost, I'm a showgirl. A showgirl? Yeah. Excellent. Well, you know, we'll have some conversations. I'll bring in some of my <laughs> friends. And, uh... A folklorist. Well, it's, um, first of all, I, I guess it started for me when I got, was very interested in folk music and sort of the art of everyday people at a very early age. It just resonated with me old-time fiddle music and folk songs and um, quilts and, you know, all that kind of stuff that's sort of homemade things that uh, aren't pretentious in any way. You don't go to college to learn them. And I became very interested in that and uh, started pursuing um, skills in that area. And then um, it happened that it was the bicentennial of our nation, 1976, and uh, the National Endowment for the Arts started funding uh, positions to be state folklorists, state folk arts coordinators. 
and I've been doing all of this work and um, helped write the grant and got the first the job as the first state folklorist of Utah. So um, for many years, I put on my tax form that I was a folklorist. And I knew that the IRS would never audit me because they wouldn't know what a folklorist was. Right. And I, I sort of like that, uh, that you're part of an occupation that, what what, is, what does a folklorist do? <laughs> but anyway, I guess we study and celebrate the, um, the expression, the everyday artistic res- expression of, of uh, ethnic groups, of um, people who play music. I... We started an event out in Elko, Nevada, called the National Cowboy Poetry Gathering. And before we started that, you know, people didn't think that cowboys could be poets, but we sort of proved that wrong. And that's a gathering that happens every year, am I correct on that? Yeah, it just, we just celebrated the 35th uh, National Cowboy Poetry Gathering. Well, see, I imagine that cowboys are still writing poetry. This isn't just historical poetry. Uh, are things still being written? Are things still being submitted for this? Oh yeah, it's a, it's a living tradition. Uh, you know, it, it it was helped along by the popularity of this event and other events like it. Uh, but it's a c- continuous tradition, and it's when you look into the history of the pastoral way of life, of uh, sort of the charged dramatic life of horsemen and. Um, the mythos of the American cowboy. It's, it's not um, so unusual that that occupation would be charged with music and poetry and, and beautiful gear, leather gear, beautiful saddles. I mean, there's a lot of beautiful expression that comes out of this, you know, sort of difficult life, you know, working out in the heat and the cold, but it has a lot of oomph going for it too. Well, I think that there certainly is a romantic notion of being a cowboy, as well as the realistic, it, right. n- not dangerous, but the realistic hard dangerous life too. that it is. Dangerous, <laughs> I imagine. Yeah. I have to say, I was really excited looking over your uh, credentials and such, going on the cowboy theme and learning about it, that you received the Will Rogers Lifetime Achievement Award in 1998. Yeah. The reason that excited me, first of all, congratulations Thanks. on receiving that, but I have to say that everything I know about cowboys, and admittedly, it's a lot less than certainly a lot of people around here. I'm not uh, from the West or even the desert. Will Rogers has been a huge, huge influence on my life. Not only some of his philosophies, but also just reading his writings and looking into his life about his love of being a cowboy and that lifestyle. Um, How did you earn the Will Rogers Lifetime Achievement Award? Yeah, I didn't apply for it. <laughs> they called me and said I was nominated for it. And, and um, you know, I've gotten a few awards for the things I've done with cowboys. You know, I'm not a cowboy myself mm-hmm. either. I, I mean, we have uh, some sheep and some cows, my wife and I. And we're, my wife grew up on a ranch and we had a little farm as I grew up. But, um, but I've made a lot of friends with cowboys, working cowboys and uh, wannabe cowboys and, you know, j- just a whole array of uh, ranch people, men and women, kids. It's a um, it's a wonderful uh, way to live. You know these multi generational ranches where families work together. It's just uh, you know in a sort of a fractured society. It's sort of cool to see <laughs> see something so intact, under threat, of course. But it's a it's an it's a nice way to live. One of the things that I was fascinated to learn is as I was growing up, I thought cowboys really were just an American thing. And uh, I started looking at South America and such, and uh, that was through my studying of Will Rogers. And also even Australia has got uh, quite a bit. I know you've done some work uh, for Australian stations, I believe. Well, <clears throat> one thing we started when, we, uh, when I was working full-time for the Cowboy Poetry Gathering was uh, – we started a program where we'd go out and do research on on basically cowboy cultures or horse cultures, herding cultures around the world. And uh, so, like, I'd go to Australia and go all over the outback and record the poetry of the outback uh, drovers and uh, uh, ringers, they call them there. And, um, and then we brought a whole group of them over here. And then we sent cowboys over to Australia to share our poetry and music with them. And there was so uh, Australia was sort of a an obvious one because we share the same language, but we've done the same thing down in Argentina and uh, 
and Brazil with gauchos. Mm -hmm. uh, we've even uh, done cultural exchanges in Mongolia with the herding people there and brought uh, the throat singers over and the people that played the Morin Hor, which is the fiddle-headed um, or the horse-headed fiddle. And uh, they do basically their version of cowboy arts uh, in Mongolia. And then we went over and th rode for three weeks uh, in the, on the steppe of Mongolia and would stop at these encampments and sing songs and trade songs back and forth. And it was what I'd call a grassroots diplomacy. Got it. Just real people being diplomats to each other. You know, it's, uh, there's nothing like the power of that. Well, that's, I, I've noticed that you went to University of Utah, of yep. course, here in 1970. So you certainly do have ties to Utah, a good portion of your life, I believe. Yeah, I'm a fourth generation Utah. Got it. But you also went to the East Coast, to the Rhode Island School of Design? Yes. For your master's? What took you out there? Uh, oh, heartbreak. <laughs> <laughs> your life is more and more of a cowboy life. Uh, well, I, I, I did broken up with my first love and... Uh, I actually went to Northwestern in Chicago and uh, couldn't take that, so I dropped out of there and then went to Rhode Island and uh, moved in with my best friend from Salt Lake and uh, some other people into an apartment, and I just couldn't come back to Salt Lake. And Then I applied to Rhode Island School of Design, and it turned out to be a great experience. I ended up getting a master's degree in filmmaking there, mm -hmm. and um, it was a great school. It's uh, the oldest art school in America and one of the largest or the largest. Gotcha. You, you went for filmmaking. Yeah. It, it's interesting to me that, for lack of a better term, a cowboy went to the eastern states to get a degree in filmmaking. So I'm assuming to make films about the West and cowboys and such. You know, I, I didn't know you could get a degree in folklore. That was sort of stupid of me, <laughs> but you can't you can really get a Ph.D. But I got a, a bachelor's degree in journalism and uh, then a, a master's degree in filmmaking. And um you know, my intention was to make documentaries about um, about the art of everyday people, and it's so folklore turned out to be a sort of perfect marriage of my academic training. And later, in at the Western Folklife Center, after I stopped uh, organizing the Cowboy Poetry Gathering, I really got back to media and did a bunch of producing, produced lots of uh, cultural features for National Public Radio produced um, two or three three PBS specials that aired nationally and won Emmy Awards and such. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I did use my skills finally. <laughs> I don't know if I'm using them anymore. Who knows? <laughs> I don't know if any of us can claim to truly know what we're doing. Uh, now, you mentioned some things that you researched and did films and also radio documentaries on. The Wright Brothers, what took you to them? Well, my, my partner, uh, a fellow named Taki Telenitas, Wonderful radio producer. He's now the uh, chief um, editor for a, a sort of investigative reporting show called Reveal. But we worked together for 14 years, and I think he came up with that. We were interested. We did a, a show about uh, a woman who built her own ultralights and would just fly all over the country and camp out and then fly another place. And we were both fascinated with flight and sort of grassroots flight and garage ingenuity. And <clears throat> and the, the Wright brothers were a great story. I mean, it was the 100th anniversary of their flight the year we did that. And we found these tapes back at a university in Ohio that had never been played since they'd been donated to this university. And it was a guy that had gone out and interviewed all the people that surrounded the Wright brothers the Wright brothers were famously shy about being recorded, so but they recorded the kids of the Wright brothers and the niece and the first pilot, and this guy recorded all these people about what it was like that the, what was the the mood of uh, Kitty Hawk and and of this uh, time in in aviation history, and we sort of cobbled this beautiful old tape together and told the story, and it just turned out to be. You know, it brought it to life in a way that you can't bring it to life without those actual voices. We just were very lucky to find that material. But I'm struck by the fact that you're you're drawn to original voices and real voices going back to the fact that that's how you learn folklore, I'm assuming, on that. Right. You, you learn it from people. Yeah. Yeah. Another time, we it was the 100th anniversary of the death of Casey Jones, the 
the iconic uh, engineer who got killed in a, a rail crash, and it became a very famous folk song, Casey Jones. Da, 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 da. <laughs> anyway, so we found this through an archivist friend of mine. We found an original tape made in the 1950s of his brakeman who was on that train when it crashed, and Casey Jones made him jump off just before it crashed. So he lived to tell the story of Casey Jones, and that was the centerpiece of that story. And I mean, you just can't, you 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 know, no what no one's retelling can match somebody who lived that emotion of um, watching his friend and famous engineer die with everyone else uh, on that uh, rail crash. Well, that's I understand the power of that, not because I made my life of that, as certainly as as you've made a wonderful life of looking at that kind of thing. But I remember I would, fell down the rabbit hole of YouTube one time, mm. uh, and I don't even remember how I got there, but there was an audio recording of the last survivor of the Abraham Lincoln shooting. And he was a young boy at the time. I believe he was six years old. And, of course, this was a recording that was made, I believe, in the late 70s, I, I want to say. So he was certainly elderly right, yeah. by that point. But to hear an account of an event that I had really only read about and I understood the importance of, but to hear that account firsthand of something that happened was pretty powerful. It's great stuff, yeah. 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 Well, I'll tell you, do, do you have any particular stories that stand out to you as being those that define you or those that you always go back to? Hmm. Um, you know, I'm not sure. I, I've always... Uh... I've sort of been a dilettante in my life. You know, I've sort of gone from thing to thing. And um, as soon as I mastered something, I, I sort of say, oh, well, that's good enough. And I reinvent myself <laughs> again. <laughs> so, you know, I've been a radio producer. I've been an event guy. I've been a folklorist. Uh, <clears throat> and now that I'm 70 years old, you know, how many times can you reinvent yourself? <laughs> right. The last uh, we'll ask Madonna or Elton yeah, John. Or. Well, the last reinvention has been as a musician, and that's something I always wanted to come back to as being a musician and a songwriter and and live a musical life. And um, so, really, since moving back to Southern Utah or moving to St. George or to Virgin, where we live, um, I've been a musician. That's really my life. And so, just about everything else that I talk about. Uh, besides my marriage, <laughs> right. is in the past tense. Got it. I'm glad to hear that, as yeah. a matter of fact. No, that's good. We've got... I actually, you, you do have a list of music recordings here that is about as long as my arm. Uh, so yeah. certainly plenty to talk about with that. And you've performed with several different groups. Uh, one that I'm actually intrigued by, Three Hat Trio. Yeah, that's, that's the current group. Gotcha. It, I just love the name of it. Three Hat Trio. It's all. It's a little redundant, you know. Right. Three Trio. That's the same thing. Three Hat Trio. Right. Yeah. I just, when I saw that, I thought, what a cool name. And then I realized, <laughs> oh, Three Hat Trio. It really is kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, and I'm impressed with where you've gone with not only this trio, but with other groups. Uh, you performed in Nagano, Japan yeah. for the Winter Olympics in 1998. Um, and I was intrigued by this. The official band for the America Three Yacht Team for the America's Cup. Yeah. And that was with a group called the Deseret String Band, both of those. Okay, got it. And yeah. Did you form these bands? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, the Deseret String Band was a group that played really old-time music. And what what our goal was is to sound as scratchy as, like, 1925 recordings. We just wanted to capture that sound of music um, sort of before everything got a little bit slick with radio and with uh, phonographs. and. So we played this old time music and we played a lot of Utah pioneer music and we played a lot of sort of pioneer music from the West. And uh, so um, the guy who uh, won the America's Cup uh, was very interested in old time cowboy stuff. In fact, he's built this old Western town. And um, anyway, he wanted us for his official band. Got it. Well, I'll tell you, I can't wait to hear more about this and also hear more about your other musical ventures and more about you. Thank you, Hal Cannon, for being a guest here on the show. And we will be right back after this news and weather break. Oh, yeah, that's Midnight Special. 
That's Midnight Special. I'm Rich Warren, inviting you to tune in to our Midnight Special, folk music and farce, show tunes and satire, madness and escape. Two hours weekly, ranging from ancient ballads to cutting-edge singer-songwriters, classic Broadway shows, and the latest British comedy, all on the Midnight Special. The Midnight Special, Saturday evenings from 7 till 9 on Radio St. George 100.3. The St. George Recreation Center is full of activities for you and your family, including youth, t-ball, baseball, and softball. Registration for those is now open until April 22nd. You're killing me, Smalls. For more information, go to sgcityrec.org. The City of St. George is a proud sponsor of Radio Dixie 91.3. Hurry up, better. It's going to be a short game and i got to get home for lunch. Hola mis amigos de Radio San George 100.3, mi nombre es Cristian, quiero invitarlos a mi show en español cada jueves de 6 a 7 de la noche. Estaremos escuchando música latina y un poco más. Los espero allá. No se lo pierdan. Bye. Our place on the internet. radiosaintgeorge.com Welcome back to Radio St. George 100.3 with On The Arts. And now your hosts, Michael and Christina Hardy. Welcome back to On The Arts. We're here with our special guest in the studio, Hal Cannon. Uh, a fascinating, fascinating figure in folklore. Folklore? Is that the way it's to folklore. put it? Folklore? Yeah. That's a, it's amazing how simple words just leave you when you're trying to speak <laughs> on the radio. Uh, but uh, a fascinating person, a musician, a songwriter, a radio producer, a folklorist, a word that I've fallen in love with, as a matter of fact. And just a fascinating dedication to the stories that are told by real people and how do you express them. We were talking a little bit about your musical ventures and how you've taken some things overseas to Japan for the Winter Olympics. And uh, you were also a, the, oh, how did they put it here? The band of choice. No, the official band for the America Three Yacht Team and such. How did you get picked up by them again? Well, uh, we we were playing at a, a big art opening up in Cody, Wyoming, of uh, uh, Remington paintings, and we met this guy who was more interested in the music we were playing than he was in the social scene. And it turned out he was a super super wealthy guy who had donated um, paintings to this exhibit. And he uh, a few months later he invited us to fly back to Cape Cod to play at a big party he was having. And uh, then he would fly us back every once in a while, and we just sort of became his house band, basically, for big events. And then when he uh, won he won the Maxi Yacht competition, then went into the America's, America's Cup and wanted us to play at that as well. Actually, we had an entertainer in Greenville, South Carolina, at a theater that I worked at. We did a play called Foxfire, which actually oh, I know took... Foxfire. Oh, do you? The oh, yeah. Hume Cronin uh, play and yeah. such? Mm -hmm. A beautiful, beautiful play. Mm -hmm. And what I loved about it is it lent itself to some pre-show entertainment uh, from a gentleman who I would call a folklorist. Now, I didn't know the word at the time, but he could play pretty much any object and turn it into an instrument. Uh, of course, you hear people playing the spoons and, and things of that sort. But he was a dynamic entertainer. I mentioned earlier Madonna and Elton John mm -hmm. re redefining themselves. What was nice about him is he wasn't redefining anything. He was just doing what he'd always done, and he loved it, and he was very, very entertaining. I have to ask you, you are a musician. How many things, and I'm going to refrain from saying instruments, how many things do you play? You know, I, I sort of uh, play a bunch of instruments. I don't play the, the fiddle or the violin, mm -hmm. <laughs> right. but I play, you know, pretty much any, any other folk instrument, uh, concertinas and accordions and banjos and mandolins and guitars and uh, I'm not a rhythm player particularly but in my current group I play guitar and banjo mm -hmm. that's all I play that's right do, do you ever make your own instruments we uh, our group made these fanciful instruments out of whatever we wanted to for a photo shoot and a video shoot one time and that's the only <laughs> <laughs> and I made this great banjo out of a horse halter and a bunch of wool from my sheep and some uh, rake and a bunch of things. And that was fun. 
I'll tell you the reason I ask. I have a friend named George Walker. Uh, I don't believe he's listening right now. He lives in California. Mm. I don't know if we reach California. Well, he can look on Facebook if he'd like. But he's you remind me a lot of him. Huh? And Or he reminds me of you, I should say. <laughs> and one of my favorite things that he did, and he would just do interesting things all the time just to fill his time. He made cigar box banjos. Oh, there's some really good ones. He was really good at this. Yeah. When we heard about it, we thought he was, oh, George is doing another project. Oh, great. But this thing sounded fantastic. Yeah. They can sound great. Yeah. I've never had one, but I've known people have had them. Yeah. Got it. I, I've noticed as well that you've re- you've released recordings of not only existing songs, but original music. Um, yeah. In fact, this, this group that I'm in currently, the Three Hat Trio, uh, every, just about everything we do is original songs that I write or um, my co-band member, uh, Greg Istock, writes uh, a lot of stuff as well. That's a, one of the things that I imagine is fascinating about being a folklorist is hearing people tell their stories— and, of course, there are songs written about their stories, and a lot of people have written about Casey Jones, for example, and uh, things like that. The music that you write, do you take stories that people have told you? Do you take your own personal experiences? How do you make it, your music? Well, you know, you can write about anything, of course. Mm-hmm. And um, the best things that you generally write about are things that you know. Uh, writing teachers will tell you that, and they tell their students that. So uh, when we got together as the Three Hat Trio, we decided that we really wanted to uh, be an original. We wanted to make original music. We wanted it to sound different than anything else. We wanted it to be about things we knew about. And we're very much inspired by the desert landscape. We live near Zion National Park. And we get up, we live with it daily. And we so we play this music that sort of quite vast and and, uh, unencumbered and uh, you know it's got complexity and yet it's got a lot of space in it too Mm -hmm. and um, so that's our sound and so there's two parts to writing songs there's the music part and the arrangements and how you sound and that's quite unique with the three hat trio but then we start we write songs that are about oh local happenings Uh, they can be really simple it can be a little love story or it can be a song about a windstorm or whether we have a song called dust devil and it it's sort of a philosophical song but uh, um but it's about dust devils got it yeah and i'll say not only some of the things that you're talking about but also your voice reminds me i hope this is okay to say but very much a prairie home companion and oh, really? uh, garrison oh, okay. keeler and uh it, one of the things i loved about the stories on those is they really it, they weren't spectacular fantastical stories i would listen to a man who was fond of his secretary named maddie and there wasn't anything lecherous or anything like that it was just she really influenced him because he really respected her and she kept him centered i will never forget this story and it wasn't dragons it wasn't or anything totally dramatic yeah yeah but it had a you know, depth to it yeah i know i i like those kinds of stories i like the, you know i like both kind i like i like to be sort of on the edge of my seat as well <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. Yeah. Uh, well, well, let me ask you, your experience on the radio, you are a radio producer as well. I was. I, you know, I haven't done it for a long time, but for years uh, I produced uh, features for NPR. Uh, we did a series, a uh, couple of, the first one we did was for a show called The Savvy Traveler, which mm-hmm. was PRI. And we do a cultural feature every week called The Open Road, where we would just sort of uh, go someplace and it could be about craps dealers in Las Vegas, or it could be about uh, a bird refuge in Alaska, or uh, going to a hula dancing class in Hawaii. And we got to, we traveled all over and did these features. Um, and then after that, we we did something called Folk Economy for the show um, uh, Marketplace. Mm-hmm. And then we started doing something for. Um, uh, weekend edition Sunday, the Sunday morning news show uh, that was called What's in a Song? And I love that. That was, uh, we would take one song and sort of go into the story behind the song. So we'd talk to the songwriter or somebody who the song meant a lot for about, and it would sort of go between music and a story. And um, what I found it would do in three to five minutes is really open up a song. Uh, you, you felt at the end of it, if we did our job right, 
that you'd heard the song, but also there was you'd you'd been privy to some deep meaning to what the song was about. Well, that's I, I mentioned earlier, Deborah Three D, who mm-hmm. actually introduced my wife and I to you uh, uh, for the show, and I. I used to do a project with her, the uh, New American Playwright Project at the Utah Shakespeare Festival. She submitted several things, huh. and now the, the word's cubed. But she wrote a play about Joe Hill, uh, you know, a, a figure with the unions and such. I remember that, yeah. It, it, quite a fun play yeah. to do. And the reason I bring that up is because there were a lot of songs in it. And, of course, Joe Hill was known as someone who would take existing songs, and he would change the lyrics a bit for his political purposes or for the union purposes. Mm-hmm. And I will never forget the rehearsal. We had Jerry uh, Rapier directed from mm-hmm. Plan B Theater up north. And we were going over these songs, and I stopped, and I just said, Jerry, these all sound the same to me. I'm sorry, I, I can't <laughs> get these melodies. And uh, he gave me some great advice on that. He was like, stop trying to learn the melodies and learn the message. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then the, me- the melodies will come. Even though these were rewritings of these songs yeah. by Joe Hill. Parodies. Yeah. I remember there was uh, uh, Nearer My Job to Thee instead uh-huh. of Nearer My God to Thee. And yeah. uh, there was even one about Casey Jones where he was talking about somebody who blindly worked uh, w- with no idea of what was coming down the tracks, I yeah. believe was the gist. Yeah. Um, but you say that uh, you've got a lot of room in these songs. I love that you also mentioned that they do sound homey. They sound like you've heard them before. Mm. What? Yeah, I, maybe less so with this new group. Uh, in the past, <clears throat> I played in more traditional groups. And, you know, folk music, uh, since it's played by non-professionals mostly, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's it's fairly simple. You know, it's often two parts two melodic parts, a verse, chorus, verse, chorus. It tells a story. It's uh, rhymed, and you can remember rhymes easier than you can remember free verse, for instance. And so there, there's a lot of sort of uh, memory cues that make it easy for people to grasp onto it and uh, make it their own. This m- music that I'm playing now is more complex. Um, it's more improvisational. Uh I played in a group before this called Red Rock Rondo that was all classical and jazz players, and I'm a folk musician. So I had to learn, you know, all of them read music and I don't. So I had to really concentrate to be able to keep up with them. <laughs> and I and I ended up really liking more complex music at this time in my life. I li- still love really simple folk songs, but I also like more complex music too. Mm-hmm. Uh, I always have, really. I, I've always... I, I, my parents took me to classical symphonies and so forth when I was a kid. and So I've grown up with a lot of different kinds of music. Well, uh, talking about you being a kid uh, here in Utah, yeah. I believe, how did all of this start for you? I mean, you've gotten into uh, folk music, which seems like a natural uh, outreach of being a folklorist, certainly. But did you find yourself always drawn to this sort of thing, or were there other aspirations you had? I used to want to be a vet, for Pete's sake. Really? And, yeah. yeah, before I you know, went into the very lucrative business of being an actor. <laughs> uh, the, yeah. uh, the, how did all this come about? I knew pretty early that I, um, I, was, I was a poor student, first of all. And uh, I found early on that if I was passionate about something, I learned it. And it didn't matter if it was a... You know, taught in school. In fact, usually it wasn't something that was taught in school. And so uh, when I got passionate about a musical instrument, learning to play the guitar, you know, it would sort of took over my life. And in school, I'd just draw instruments and stuff and daydream. And and I so I knew early on that um, I wasn't going to be a traditional, I wasn't a traditional learner. And I had my uh, learning defects, I guess. And um, And so... I had models around me of, of artists. I had a great uncle who was an architect and valued his life as an artist. I had an older cousin who was a concert pianist um, who started the Gina Bachauer co- competition uh, and taught at BYU. I, I had, you know, my, my family loved the arts. Um, so it wasn't sort of out of the question that I could go in that direction. Mm-hmm. I think for a lot of people it is out of the question. You know, their parents really discourage them from it. But my parents didn't. They uh, encouraged me to be an artist if I wanted to be. And um, 
you know, I've been lucky. I, you know, really every step of the way, I had no idea when I went in a certain direction if I could make a living doing it. And luckily, I'm entrepreneurial enough that sort of all of my passions yielded something that could, you know, put food on the table. Well, we've had a lot of guests on the show, and we've actually talked about this quite a bit, who have gone into, do I do this to make a living, or do I do this because it fulfills me, or do I do it out of habit, which is sometimes the case. And we often address the, is it a living or is it a life? That rather cliche way of putting it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've found with all of the guests over all three of our seasons, we talked about that earlier, but three seasons of this show... (laughs) Uh, well over 60 guests, as a matter of fact, is that everybody does it not because they feel they have to, but because they want to. They really, they're drawn to something, whether it be voice, whether it be sculpture or painting, or they just, it makes them happy. So they do it. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, if you analyze the business part of it, being a musician these days or a songwriter is really a (laughs) poor business model. And it's getting worse, you know, with the digit- digitization of everything and everybody expecting their music free. and Right. All of those things discourage uh, professionalism. But uh, at the same time, I think there's probably more musicians than ever. You know, there's just more people out there that just have to play music and find fulfillment. They find a social life in it. They find, they find um, uh, mates through it. Um, I mean, it's a, uh, it is a life. Well, I remember in the fourth grade, my teacher was Mrs. Leibensberger. Uh, it took me forever to learn how to pronounce that. Mm. And if she's listening now, I finally got it. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, but I remember the most special time during the week was when she would pull out her guitar. And I remember that to this day. We would be all excited. And we had the television shows of the time. We had 321 Contact and all these shows. I can't even remember what they were called. And uh, we had the technology. The Apple II computer had just come out. And, wow. uh, you know, we could do basic. We could make a line go across the computer. And that was great. But it always came back to that time on Friday afternoons. And we knew it was coming when she would pull out that guitar. And I can even remember the songs that she sang. And they weren't. Songs that I think I could even find today. There were songs about Mississippi and why is it spelled that way? And that was one of my favorites. And, you know, the the Ladybug in the Teacup. I remember these songs. That's great. What a, what a teacher. Sounds, oh, she was wonderful. Yeah, that's wonderful. Gotcha. And, you know, I think of even Mayberry and things like that, watching Andy <laughs> Griffith on the, on the porch and such. Yeah. Well, let me tell you, uh, your wife right now, uh, you actually speak very fondly of it's really fun when you said earlier that that's the only thing that's not in the past or or past tense you had a little bit of a sparkle there is is she an artist as well she is she's a she's a wonderful artist Uh, her name's Teresa jordan and Uh uh, she's uh we've been married 27 years uh she is a, a painter and a visual artist and also a writer she's best known for her books i think um she's written uh, books. She grew up on a ranch, went to a one-room school in Wyoming, uh, way out in the middle of nowhere, and uh, then ended up at Yale. I mean, you know, she was she's a smart person and mm-hmm. uh, very creative, uh, extremely creative. And it's just always uh, a joy to uh, have her to come home to at night. And you've had the pleasure of a couple of youngins, too. Uh, got one. We've got a gotcha. daughter and two grandchildren. Gotcha. And, uh, they're in Salt Lake City. So, yeah, I feel very fortunate. Got it. And do you feel like they're inspired by the work that you do, the art? Are they into it? Mm. My my daughter, um, she's a professor at uh, Westminster College in education. Uh-huh. And she always, you know, I, I feel like she has a lot of talent as an artist, but that's never been, you know, she really likes to serve people and to teach and to, uh, she's also got a great academic mind, writes p- great papers and, um, is well respected in her field, and her her partner is a really brilliant marketing guy. You know, the kind of person that understands the statistics of people. And so, you know, when you uh, even think that you want a new down sleeping bag, <laughs> now the next day you turn on Facebook and it shows you all these ads for. Th- <laughs> anyway, he's figured that out. It's called artificial intelligence. <laughs> oh my gosh! Kind anyway, of the actuarial intelligence. I know, it's scary. 
My gosh. <laughs> so um, you have definitely roots here and such. Yeah. And you went to Rhode Island and uh, Europe. Do you have a place that you're yearning to go to find out more? Oddly enough, I just I just wake up in the morning, look around where I live, and just say, wait, it just does not get better than this. Uh you know, our band is traveling quite a bit. We're headed back to, uh, for the third time, to Scotland and England and Wales. Uh, we've never played in Wales before, so that should be fun. When We're playing in the highlands of Scotland in uh, September. That should be great. And then uh, last year we toured in uh, uh, Netherlands, Sweden, and Denmark. And uh, we're going back to the Netherlands. And uh, we have actually tour, two tours lined up for the Netherlands. And it's really, um, I love I love traveling around in Europe, and I love the European audiences. They uh, they they grow up learning to listen, and right. <laughs> and, and it's just a great learning or listening audience. So we feel very fortunate that we have agents in England and in Amsterdam that book us and get us over there. We're actually much better known in Europe than we are here. (laughs) (laughs) Which I think is so great. We talk about down-home stories and uh, folklore and such, and you think, oh, it's such a small provincial thing, but it really does connect us all. Yeah, and there's a lot of people around the world who love sort of uh, interesting and creative experiences from the U.S. And, uh, you know, America's always had sort of a creative uh, thing going, and, um, and I think people love that we're trying to do something a little different in the Americana field that's about the desert rather than about the the hills of Appalachia, for instance. Or, right. You know, something they've heard before. And would that be more of the bluegrass kind of stuff? Yeah. But, but Americana, it, you know, we're trying to make a statement about where we live and, and people haven't heard that. Right. Yeah. Well, have you ever found that, uh, even domestically rather than abroad, are there misconceptions about cowboys or uh, the stereotypes, if you will? Oh, there's misconceptions and stereotypes about everything, (laughs) as as you know. I mean, it's just, it's hard not to uh, oversimplify things. I mean, I like like a simple message as much as anyone else. But for instance, when we started the Cowboy Poetry Gathering, there were so many people that just could not accept the fact that cowboys could be articulate, that cowboys could be thoughtful, that cowboys could be feeling. Um, and so, uh, you know, it was it was wonderful in some respects. We got to prove people wrong, but we also got to open a world. I mean, wherever there are stereotypes, there's an opportunity to open up a new world. Um, so I don't I don't really begrudge people for stereotypes. We all we all do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, as long as we we're open hearted. That's, I guess, where, you know, that's sort of the the little litmus test for me. Well, that's with the Cowboy Poetry Gathering. When it started out, were you getting mostly cowboys just getting together to share? Or is this an event where all sorts of people came to find out about it? Initially, it really was ranch people that came Mm -hmm. from all over that were curious about it. And the only place we really advertised it were in places like Western Horseman Magazine and and so people were curious, and they came, and it was sort of a bunch of journalists and a bunch of sort of local ranching people. And then as the word got out, it became more a popular event of people who were interested in the Western heritage. Um, I would say it's, a, it's a, a smaller part of the audience now that are actually ranch people who live on ranches. A lot of the cowboys, uh, poets, most of them are— are horsemen or working cowboys. Not, I mean, not all of them, but quite right. a few. Well, and uh, are you involved at all with Coyote Tales at Kayenta? Have you heard of that event? I've heard of it, um, but no, I'm, I'm not involved with it. Our band just did a concert at Kanda Art Center a oh, really? few weeks ago. Yeah, I'm actually rather embarrassed. I should have known about that and advertised oh, it. That was a lot of fun. We've played there twice now. Got it. And, and Yeah, I, I'm, I'm looking for. I just love the productions that are done out there. Really looking forward to this Hank Williams yeah. uh, show in May that uh, Mr. Chris Whiteside is doing. Right. And I yeah. understand he's done that show before, yeah. I think with the Neil Simon Festival. Yeah. And it was actually quite popular, I believe. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing it and seeing it. So would you say Hank Williams, uh, are there any other particular influences for you? Oh, you know, I I listen to a lot of old old music, but I'm, I listen probably to more uh, mu- new music. Uh 
There's a singer-songwriter that we actually had at Canta a few, about a couple months ago named Tom Russell. He has a new album out. Love that. Tim O'Brien is another guy. He just recorded one of my songs. I really like his music. Mandolin Orange. I draw slow. I, don't, I could go on. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, uh, Hal Cannon, thank you so much for being a guest on the show. As is always the case, we run out of time just as we start going You made going it go fast. Just remember, I'm a showgirl, okay? <laughs> First will. and foremost. Hal Cannon, showgirl. Thank you. And I do hope that our listeners will continue to seek out work by Hal Cannon. And uh, as well, we'll hopefully have him back on the show if he agrees to that. Maybe even his wife. We'll yeah. get to know some other artists. Thank you for listening Tuesdays and Thursdays at 4 p.m., on the arts. And until you hear from us again, we hope you keep your focus on the arts. You've been listening to On the Arts with Michael and Christina Harding. Search Facebook, YouTube, Podbean, Spotify for Radio St. George to view video and podcasts of this show or go to RadioStGeorge.com. Join us Tuesdays and Thursdays at 4 for On the Arts on Radio St. George 100.3.